Game of Thrones Season 8 Revisited. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Nerd Soup. I am Bo Oliver, here with Aaron, the Nerd Soup Monkey, and we are back to take one final look at the final season of Game of Thrones. Now, I'm not really someone who likes to kick a man when he's down, but Game of Thrones has completely vanished, disappeared from our collective conscious without a trace, so you can't kick something that's not there. In fact, I'm still confused by those who claim the ending to be divisive because everyone seems to be united in their hatred for it. So we're going to try our best to temper our emotions and take a level-headed approach when looking back on Game of Thrones Season 8, arguably the most infamous single season of television in the history of TV. Now, before we get into all that, we would like to thank Skillshare for sponsoring this video, and thanks to Skillshare, the first 1,000 people who click the link in the description box below will receive two free months of Skillshare's premium membership, and after that, it's only around $10 a month. Skillshare has created an online learning community committed to inspiring creators to explore new skills, develop existing interests, and get lost in creativity. Whether if you are a professional content creator or just an artist who creates in their free time, Skillshare will help you connect with fellow creators and teachers from around the world who are willing to share their knowledge. Their multitude of classes in drawing, writing, filming, photography, etc. can be a great way to help manage stress, practice mindfulness, and feel connected in these times of social distancing. This highlighted course here, taught by Daniel Krissa, Creative Breakthrough, Eight Exercises to Power Your Creativity, Confidence, and Career, is a great introductory course for new members who are eager to learn. Danielle highlights her own experiences as a graphic designer while also using those lessons to help individuals take advantage of their own creative potential. And of course, there are thousands of other courses spanning a wide range of different topics, so if you're interested in honing your creative skills, make sure you click the link in the description box below. The first 1,000 people to click the link will receive two free months of Skillshare's Premier Membership, and after that, it's only around $10 a month. So, don't wait. Get to creating. Just don't, you know, create YouTube videos about Game of Thrones. That's what we do. Well, this is the last one, so I hope it's good. I know death. He's got many faces. I look forward to seeing this one. So, Aaron, I kind of want to start with your thoughts on the aftermath of Game of Thrones. Where do you see Game of Thrones' place in pop culture now after having such a divisive finale? It's tough because most of the Game of Thrones community does not like season eight, and that's understandable. But for me personally, I still love the show as a whole, and I still think it's one of the best series in television history. That being said, the taste of season eight is still so fresh in a lot of people's mouths that it's hard to talk about it without bringing that up. It's always Game of Thrones is great, but what happened in season eight? Yeah, I think so. And for a long time, I thought maybe I would never be able to go back and rewatch because my biggest problem with Season 8 is Jon Snow and the White Walkers, that whole story. And I was wondering, would I be able to sit through that slow burn knowing that it's so rushed in the end? Because that's the biggest problem, is, is the pacing, the jump. But after re-watching Season 8, so many of these episodes just, on their own, they stand out mm -hmm. as traditional. The writing is still the same, the acting is there, of course, and they look incredible. But you almost have to ignore the setup to enjoy some of these episodes. And that's where I stand on it now, where I will be able to go and watch from the beginning because the beginning is so strong and you could still feel those emotional connections to these character endings because I enjoyed for the most part where these characters ended up. Yeah my overall assessment of the season is still that of disappointment. There are things I like there are things I don't like and we'll get into all that throughout this video but I still do think it's the worst season and the thing with Game of Thrones is even in its lesser seasons five and seven for example they still had moments of greatness that the whole community can get behind and still have optimism going forward and it's that kind of precedent of excellence that it's set that I think think is a big reason why a lot of people were so disappointed in season eight. This is Game of Thrones. You're not supposed to be disappointed. When someone like me who defends it more than other people is still left saying things like disappointment, rushed, it's just fine. Well, just fine isn't good enough for Game of Thrones. I think the last time Game of Thrones peaked was season seven, episode four. I think that's the last time the fan base was solely 
just wholly united for one moment in one episode, and we were still on board for where the story was going. But yeah, no, season eight, I mean, we'll just jump right into the finale because this is the one year later after The Iron Throne aired, and I guess we'll start with Daenerys Targaryen, the most popular character in the show, the most recognizable character on the show, and the the performance by Amelia Clark in season eight is the standout. Everyone has said that. But her character, coincidentally, has also been the most controversial because of what happens, her burning down King's Landing. But she's terrific delivering this speech in Dothraki. And it's just, it represents the performance as a whole, this moment right here. I think, and I'll probably say this numerous times throughout this review, but a lot of the episodes and moments are good in a vacuum, where if these were placed within a 10 episode, maybe even a two season arc, maybe some slight changes, but it was just plugged in with proper setup, I think some of these episodes would have been really good and very well received. I think the first part of the finale is fantastic. The problem is that a lot of people didn't buy Daenerys' transformation, so the whole time they're watching it, it just seems off. Right. But if there was proper setup to this first half hour of this episode, I think it would have been one of the the best sequences in Game of Thrones because she is legit terrifying here. Right, and I think the whole season as a whole has a problem with moments where they have these big moments that were supposed to hit us in a certain way. This is supposed to be incredible and it looks incredible. King's Landing covered in ash. Was it snow? No, it's actually ash. You have the Targaryen sigil draped over the ruins of the Red Keep. She's delivering this speech in a in Dothraki and Valyrian, and it's haunting. It's chilling. Yeah, everything about it. The vibes are great. The but look she gives John when she's just staring through his soul. You didn't earn that. Yeah, you didn't earn that moment. And also the bells. I think the bells as an episode. It's it kind of gives all similar vibes to the Sopranos finale, where everything you know that something bad is going to happen. And Tyrion, the whole episode is kind of just trying to hold the tide with a broom to steal a quote from Blade Runner. That episode is incredible, but you didn't earn it. You just didn't. And watching Daenerys go crazy just makes me so much more excited for the books, if they're ever going to be finished by George R. R. Martin, because I want to see how he does this. Yeah. I want to get inside of her mind for, in those POV chapters. What is it? What is... Obviously, we see it in this season, but to me, it, it just felt it's too quick. I think there could have been a couple little tweaks that would have made it better if they were still going to do the six-episode uh, season for the finale. I think one of the things is Aegon Targaryen, Jon Snow. I think that should have been made known before the battle at Winterfell because when they're all celebrating at the end, it's not it's Jon Snow. He won the battle. And that's one of the things that kind of leads to Daenerys maybe turning Mad Queen. But imagine if they were celebrating Aegon Targaryen, rightful heir of the throne, as winning this battle. I think something like that, just a little tweak like that, could have been a good starting point to set these things into motion. Even though we've seen instances of her kind of making some decisions in the past that you could argue are mor morally right or wrong, I think that there's a way to kind of build off of something like that with the deaths of Rhaegal and with the death of Masande, and maybe just an episode or two more. Because that, that scene is just John with his best friends being called a king, and yeah. Daenerys feels totally alienated. But if all the You're lords, not home. Yeah. You know, I, I understand Tyrion wants to get drunk with Jamie and Brienne. What are you going to chop it up with Varys? Varys notes that, that she's lonely and she walks away all by herself. But <laughs> it's that's not enough in that moment with the Starbucks coffee cup. I think the one thing that bothers me and probably a lot of other people is that the bells were ringing and it was one. And Daenerys throughout this whole series, like I said, she's made some decisions in the past. And Tyrion even talks about that in the finale with Jon. Just everything we know about that character, I don't think that's a decision, no matter how distraught she was, that she would make. I think if it was a do or die situation where maybe Drogon is injured or Cersei has some tricks up her sleeve and the battle could be lost and she makes that decision. You can still spin that as Jon and Tyrion just being horrified of what she's done. And even the events leading up to that, even if she didn't destroy King's Landing, the fact that both Tyrion and Jon had no idea if or not she was going to do that, that speaks a lot. That's someone, that's something that they could talk about after and be like, well, that's too close. What happens next time? Right, but the question that everybody has is, what was Jon Snow's identity supposed to mean? And I think in the books, Jon is going to flirt with the idea of taking the Iron Throne, and that's going to alienate Daenerys. Jon effectively doesn't change at all from this revelation. The only thing, the only two things that really change for him, maybe Ned Stark lied once, that was a big revelation, and I'm disgusted by Daenerys, I can't have sex with her anymore. And maybe if he does have sex with her the night before the bells, that never happens. But this revelation doesn't change him at all. It does for Daenerys a bit because she begs him not to tell Sansa, and Sansa expertly uses that secret to spread it across the kingdoms. Varys is executed because of it. Tyrion ultimately is imprisoned. It causes chaos throughout her ranks, her already depleted ranks. But maybe if you had Jon Snow flirting with that idea of honoring his mother and his father, 
honoring their sacrifice, maybe trying to take that throne and then pulling back, but the mistakes he made were already in motion, and he's already ruined that relationship with Daenerys. You don't see any of that. I mean, we, we've talked about it so many times, everyone's talked about it. I don't want it. That's my queen. His dialogue and his character arc are terrible. He tells, he, he's got eight queen counts in this whole season. I think the scene between Jon and Daenerys before the bells in episode five should have been much more substantial. If that's going to be the last scene they share together before she does this, and then the next time they meet after this horrific event, that's, you need to have that scene have something, it has to be more than that. Why can't Jon Snow speak in this season? It's like he has nothing clever to say anymore. Yeah, and even in the show, obviously they dumb him down a bit in the show. He was always clever. He always had witty remarks. And these, these past couple of seasons, it's like he doesn't even know what to say. He's just so overwhelmed by everything. I mean, there's a ton of maybe they should have done this, they should have done that. But I think it would have been good to see John maybe realize, along with Tyrion and Varys, that even though I don't want to be king, I have to. Or right, Or something yeah. bad is going to happen. Or if he got corrupted that way. But I also don't necessarily hate John's ending because he is finally free, and I think John. I love his ending, and I think John. He's got the best ending out of any of them. Like it's a, an it's a <laughs> it's a dosy do by Bran. I think in the aftermath of the Belves, he in his mind he just thinks he failed. There's no other nothing he can do besides kill Daenerys at that moment and protect future generations. But even I don't think it was ever in his mind to maybe stake his claim and try to lead a rebellion against him because there's nothing for, left for him to do. He failed. And yeah, he has to live with that, and I think him finally being free up in the north is kind of poetic in a way because he's not a Stark, he's not a Targaryen, he's a man of the Night's Watch. Yeah, it is poetic. But like I said, if he has, if he's more complicit in the books with her destroying King's Landing, I think that makes that ending even better because it is bittersweet because he may feel that responsibility for the rest of his life and I guess he'll just try and pay for his sins up north wandering with Tormund leading these these new people. Not new people, old people that he's familiar with, but a new challenge for him. But in the show, he that scene with Tyrion is actually pretty well written when he's trying to justify what Daenerys did, saying Cersei gave her no choice. It is pretty disturbing to see how brainwashed he is, and it, it isn't until Tyrion mentions his sisters, Sansa and Arya, that he does come to the decision, I have to kill Daenerys. But once again, he kills Daenerys, and I feel nothing. That's I guess that's supposed to be his big moment, because going to episode 3, the Long Knight, once again, this is Jon Snow's fight. He's bad in this episode because he doesn't do much. And I'll tell you what, his opponent, the Night King, might be even worse. <laughs> the Long Knight, to me, it's, it's an episode that I enjoyed because at the time I found it to be so cinematic. Another point, I watched it twice for this review. If you're watching this on a non-LED TV, you cannot see a thing. Oh, I watched it in the daytime. I had to close my blinds, block them. It was yeah. You need to build an igloo or put something. Put my brightness just, up. Well, it was. It's no. It's uh. If if you don't have like a 4K o OLED TV, then you're not gonna get. And it makes you wonder. HBO, your your major audience is people watching on televisions. I didn't have that problem the first time I saw it because I was just so in the moment of the episode. And I think part of me kind of liked that I couldn't see the threat. It made it a little bit scarier. Like darkness is coming. This is the uh, long winter. This is the Night King. He's here. There's no sunshine. It's we're here and we're going to massacre you. But watch yeah, it. Yeah, it is nighttime. You want that realism. But maybe they just thought future generations are all going to have 4K TVs, you know? In 10, 15 years, everyone's going to be able to see what was happening in this episode. I don't know. D does any of the disappointment for season eight come from this episode for you? No, I think this is where it all started. If I'm looking back from when this aired, but, and I understand that completely, but one of the things, if I recall that I liked about this episode and how they wrapped it up is that we only had six episodes. So we were going to move back to the politics and what I loved about Game of Thrones and the back and forth, but we really didn't get much of that the last three episodes. So, well, there's that great line when Davos is trying to understand what the Lord of Light wanted them to do. What, what's his purpose? purpose we have he has us fight his war and then he disappears and Tyrion says it's not going to make you very happy contemplating those questions and Davos goes maybe I don't want to be happy so Tyrion says well we still have us to contend with it's so well written and it's so true you're getting back to the politics it is a show called Game of Thrones that's what it is ultimately about it's about the struggles and the duality of men and Tyrion realizes yeah the real it's kind of like Westworld season three where Rehoboam is just trying to delay humanity from destroying itself. <laughs> I guess that's what the Night King maybe was doing. Well, he... I'll just do it for you, actually. Let's not delay it. I'll just wipe you out. But the battle, it just... If you want to wipe the Night King and the White Walkers out in one episode, they have to go out Game 7 NBA Finals, giving it their all, and it's not that. Because essentially the Night King and the White Walkers are used as a plot device. Right? Yes. To bring Daenerys and Jon together, mainly. And I don't hate that idea, but I think a lot of people were expecting more. And I think if you 
maybe stretch this out a couple more episodes, I think would have been more satisfying. Maybe a little bit more backstory. And I do think the whole thing with Bran, I think we could have got more with that. I'm not completely sold on the whole thing of he wants to kill Bran because he is this world's memories. That's fine, but I think a little more would have maybe raised the stakes or give us more understanding of what's about to happen. Because their whole game plan uh, revolves around Bran. And looking back on that, I'm like, why is he the main focus? Why is his life more valuable to Sam, who's getting attacked while John's running? I need to get to Bran. I mean, the world has gone on long enough without the knowledge of a three-eyed raven, and he really doesn't, his powers don't really do anything to, I guess, inspire everyone. It's like, no, we need to keep Bran alive. Because at this point, there's no knowledge of him potentially being king. Well, that be, that the fantasy elements in this show were just kind of referenced instead of being explained. And they were always kept hidden. And then they would come to light and it would be really interesting for these characters to kind of understand and try and understand these revelations. But now it's just they refer to the Night King and nobody explains anything. Oh, the Night King's coming. Who is that? Mm-hmm. Who is the Night King? I'm the Three-Eyed Raven. I have the world's memories. Why? Who are you? Didn't you die? Didn't you get pushed out of a window? Nothing's explained anymore. It's just, it's the same thing with the traveling. It's lazy writing. It's writing done without reflection. Now that the audience knows this, we can assume that all the characters know it. It's not a good way to write your story. And if there was a conversation beforehand, like, we need Bran. He has this sight. If we want to make a better world, he's going to be a key point. Yeah, because right now they're making their stand at Winterfell. The whole recorded history is in Old Town. Why, do, why are we saving Bran? I mean, they're using him as bait, obviously. Yes. John runs past Sam because that's his opportunity to get to the Night King. But I want to focus on that, too. The White Walkers in this episode, cannot stress it enough, are awful. All The, the worst thing that may have ever happened to this show was Hardhome. Because D&D saw the Night King walking out real slow and real cool. Great job by Miguel Sapochnik. And they thought, oh, the audience love that. No, we love that because in that moment it was new. It was unique. We're seeing a new element, a new dimension to his power, the White Walker's abilities. We don't we don't see them a lot in Hardhome, but when that one lieutenant fights Jon Snow, he handles him pretty easily until Jon Snow is desperately able to grasp his magical sword that was forged from the flame of a dragon. That's why that's cool. But recycling that in the long night isn't cool. Watching the Night King raise up everybody again, not cool. <laughs> We've already seen it. Take it to another level. I want the Night King throwing people into brick walls, ripping their guts out, slicing them in half, and all of his boys. They're walking around like they're too cool for school. What are they doing? <laughs> this is the fight. I think from a... Uh, this ba- is the fight. I think the battle itself, as forgiving I am of this episode and some of the elements of the season as a whole, there are still things like the Dothraki with steel blades <laughs> leading the charge. They didn't know Melisandre was going to come. Why is Ghost in the front lines? Ghost can't kill a white Because that would look cool to the audience. Yeah. I get why they would have the Dothraki, because all we know about them and all we've heard throughout the whole series is they're unbeatable in the open field. But not with steel blades against an enemy, you need dragon glass, fire, or Valyrian steel to kill. M- Melisandre should have came earlier. She should have been part of the plan. That could have been... that Just just like that, it's fixed. Also, you don't get a pass for Mil- Melisandre disappearing and then showing back up. I mean, you're allowed to randomly introduce Melisandre into this show because you can assume that she is a smart and capable individual in this world who was following the events of Westeros and knew that I can plant my flag with Stannis and get that political influence. This is my path to power. But now it's, I'm going to Volantis, I came back, and now I have this magical spell. You you don't get you don't get a pass for that. You can't do one thing early, in your earlier seasons and then disregard it in the later seasons. Melisandre is a major supporting character of this show. And I think there there's some give and take here because maybe if there was some more, I guess, back and forth where they have more tricks up their sleeves and there's some optimism at times, but the force is just so overwhelming that eventually they have to cave in and it seems like all hope is going to be lost. But at the same time, I like this force has been hyped for so long. I like how it's just a bludgeoning. So the way the battle, the tides turned, I don't know if you could make some adjustments to that, but I think one Winterfell seems very small in this battle. <laughs> yeah, it does. When I was watching like Return of the King, like that felt like a massive area. It just felt like more epicness to it. And when they show the over overhead shots, it looks bigger. But when they focus in on Winterfell and the battle itself, it just feels very small and contained. But the pacing is so off. And I'm going to go back to the Night King because when he arrives in the Godswood, when he's there to kill Bran, we're at 1 hour, 11 minutes, and 30 seconds. He doesn't reach for his sword until 1 hour, 16 minutes, and 15 seconds. That's 4 minutes and 45 seconds of Dijawadi's amazing theme for the Night King. (laughs) But why are we wasting 5 minutes for my man to reach for a sword? 
that's such bad pacing in an episode like this. And somebody said that you can tally up maybe an hour, an hour plus of characters just walking and staring in this season. It's not cool. It's cool when you do it in Hard Home, like I said. But it's not cool when you keep dragging it out in this episode. I, it's so anticlimactic now, especially with Arya flying in. Do you like Arya killing the Night King? Yes, I do. I think John should have had a moment that wasn't just, like you said before, him rushing at him and him raising the dead. There should have been more going on around that rather than cutting to Brienne and Jamie just cutting at random wi uh, whites. They should have been fighting maybe the White Walkers, this epic battle, and just kind of maybe get one of them killing one of them. Some of the, the whites they're controlling goes down and kind of maybe putting a pep in the Night King's steps. Like, oh, maybe they can do something here. I think John should have had a showdown with him defending Bran, and ultimately he gets overwhelmed, and then that's when Arya comes in. I think that would have been cool because Arya is one of my favorite characters, and I still love that moment. I have the fucking t-shirt. <laughs> it's... Yeah, well, to, to take this battle as a whole, I'll reference Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. People, the way they analyze that battle is that every shot matters. Every shot leads to a counterattack or it moves the story and the battle forward simultaneously. That does not happen in this episode, and I wish there was more of that back and forth between Jon, the Night King, and also Bran. Bran using his Worgen powers. When, when he tells Theon, I have to go now, I want to see him Doctor Stranging. Where Doctor Strange has that great moment in Infinity War where he turns into the 30 different Doctor Strangers. But then he gets his ass kicked. But that's cool. Everybody talks about the moment when Doctor Strange did that because it was a cool hero moment for him, even though he lost. Give Bran those hero moments. But for... I'm... I almost wish that John and Arya had coordinated this attack where Arya does get the final blow, but I almost want to see her die in this moment where she gives her life killing the Night King. They come to blows at the exact same moment. She bleeds out, he disappears, and she gets that hero's death because we always anticipated that she would die young, but maybe that's a book thing. I think it is, that she goes on to just be an explorer. I don't think that ending doesn't hit as hard as Sansa, Bran, and John for me. Arya just going on to, to explore. So I wish John had more of a crucial role besides just screaming at the dragon. <laughs> the dragon fight is fantastic though and I think But it, I I don't know who's fighting. Even in age, even in 4K I don't know who's fighting. I, I I still love the dragon fight and that one shot is I think is one of the best shots in the whole series when With they the go moon. above the clouds. I said this when the episode aired. I think what made it messy is the inclusion of the Night King. I know he's cool and I know he's badass and he was an awesome inclusion at the time. I think that complicates things because with the head of this massive army and this kind of unknown presence leads to speculation. In the books, there is no Night King, so the White Walkers are a, they're talked about as a whole. The focus isn't on one individual being. So and naturally, when you have that focus, it's going to lead to, I want more from this character. There has to be something. When in reality, it's just supposed to be the threat as a whole, not one entity. Yeah, maybe the fan base can be accused of looking too far into the White Walkers and what they mean and what they represent. Maybe it's just they're the underlying threat that humanity has ignored and it's um, a metaphor for climate change. That's all it is. That doesn't change the fact that not only does the Night King suck in this episode, but his boys suck too. So I just need to see the Night King act like a badass. If you remove the Night King, the White Walkers still pretty much suck in this episode. I mean, you can have any other White Walker on that dragon. I'm still not going to really enjoy what they did. The Whites are great, but how many times... I mean, we've seen zombie battles before. We've seen other zombies. The zombies are cool because we know what's behind them. And for me, I mean, this should have been a bloodbath. Like, when they charge, when they stampede Grey Worm and the Unsullied, they should have killed off Grey Worm right in that moment. Make it that subversive. Make it that hor horrifying. Red Wedding times 10. That's what this should have been. I mean, we have character deaths, but it's like, check, gotta kill off Barrack now. Check, gotta kill off Ed, because we're not gonna kill off Sam. Uh, Lady Mormont, great death, actually. <laughs> that moment makes, <laughs> it gets me hype. Makes me want to fight a giant. But this episode, the White Walkers are terrible, and that's, if you want to do a shortened season, first of all, I don't even know what season 7 is, now looking back. Season 7 feels like it doesn't even exist. You gotta give me more White Walkers in Season 7 if you want to wipe them out in one episode. And if you do want to wipe them, you can get away with this. That's the thing. They could have gotten away with shortening the season if they just made these characters more awesome. Well, I <laughs> think Embrace the fantasy elements rather than rehashing things that you've already done. Well, like how you said before how there's so much time where the characters are just looking and walking and whatever. I think what made Game of Thrones great and what gets lost with a shortened season and why I think you needed 10 for the last two seasons is... The smaller moments, they build off of each other. They try to squeeze everything in 
to one scene where normally it would play out over multiple scenes throughout multiple episodes and build upon each other. Here they're like, they had a check a checklist, like we need to establish these things all in this one scene. Episode two is just completely filler. And I remember at the time I defended this episode saying it's going to be one of the hardest episodes to go back and watch because we're kind of just saying goodbye to a lot of these characters. But <laughs> how you can have filler in a shortened season to me, it, it's just beyond me. Because a lot of this is just characters sitting around in the castle, even Brienne being knighted. It was great in the moment, but I, don't, I wanted to skip this episode. I really did. And Tyrion, he has a great couple of episodes to finish the season, but he is so annoying in these first two episodes. Just referencing Tywin, referencing old quotes that he made from season one, he's just there to be kind of annoying. It's the only, t every character in the show, in the books, they're always annoyed by Tyrion. We are never annoyed by Tyrion, we just think he's funny. It's the only time I've ever been annoyed by Tyrion. Like, shut the fuck up, dude. I do like the first two episodes, but in a shortened season, it's looking back, they could have done something else, but I think these two episodes were received fairly well when they first happened, because they were your classic setups. Oh yeah, and definitely. We didn't that was a fun week between episode one and two. With all the memes, all the Bran looking at Jamie memes, Bran staring at everybody. That was uh, the golden age to be in the Game of Thrones fandom. And But to, to focus on some of the writing here, the writing in this scene between Davos, Varys, and Tyrion is fantastic. This is classic Game of Thrones writing. It's them realizing that they're never going to have the traditional happy ending that everyone would want to see. And the writing is just, it's perfect. Um, but then this scene, when Daenerys arrives and they're holding court and they're discussing how they're going to feed the army, and Sansa says, what do dragons eat, anyway, and Daenerys goes, whatever they want. And they focus on Sansa, and then they focus on Daenerys. Why are you bringing emphasis to a line that's not that clever? It's not that bad, either. But if you had written this where it was realistic, where the debates that they were having between Sansa and Daenerys were realistic and logistical, because they're bringing up these problems that are never going to be addressed again. How do we feed Dothraki? How do we feed dragons? But we're never going to talk about it again. Daenerys could be like, we brought our own food, dummy. Give them something clever. Make these back and forths feel more natural. It, it felt like they were just trying to be a bit too clever. Even Tyrion and Varys, when Tyrion says, you can't freeze your balls off because you don't have balls. Got him. <laughs> oh! <laughs> and one more thing about the long night. I think there's one part in episode four that I kind of kind of sums up why I, I think people don't like the long night as a whole. When the people find out what we have done for them, we saved them. Cersei will make sure they don't believe it. And that kind of shows that this was such an isolated event. It wasn't the Long Night. It wasn't Westeros under this threat. It was basically the North and the armies they amassed. So while they made this sacrifice, no one outside of that immediate area knows what happened, knows what they did. And it kind of is just a non-issue for the greater part of Westeros. The only reason I would counter that is because I think it does add to Daenerys' madness because that's her greatest victory. That's her biggest hero moment, bringing the dragons north, defeating this threat that seemed to be just impossible to overcome. And then nobody really celebrates it. Or when they do celebrate it, they celebrate Jon. And down south, they don't even think that it actually happened. I think that's hilarious. But in terms of your point for how it relates to what's going down in the capital with Cersei. A lot of people were disappointed that she doesn't have more of an active role, I guess not necessarily fighting in the Long Night, but more of, I guess, a polit- I mean, there could have been more political maneuverings that she could have made besides sending Bronn to kill Tyrion and Jaime. She's she could have capitalized on this in a different way. She's barely in the first four episodes. No, yeah, and her, she's in episode five, I guess that's her big moment. Yeah, it's- I No, don't... no, at the end of episode four, sorry, when she executes uh, Masande. I don't know. Cersei, we always talked about how strong her arc was throughout the uh, first seven seasons. I think maybe this hinges on Tyrion, the fact that Tyrion is completely good in the show. That they don't dive into the complexities of Tyrion traveling to Essos whatsoever. So his, his goals are very one-minded. So he doesn't have that kind of extra edge to get revenge against Cersei. It's if more about supporting Daenerys and hoping that I'm not wrong. It has nothing to do with getting revenge at this point. If you combine seven and eight, I think it, it's an easier, I guess, pill to swallow not having Cersei in those episodes. But after, you can't ignore the wait. After a year and a half and you, you, all this anticipation for the season and Cersei is barely in it, it's disappointing for one of the best and who I think is the best character in the whole show. 
she's very competitive in season seven and you maybe wish that they would have saved some of that for season eight or you get into the long night earlier in season seven like you said you do all of that back to back you keep cersei competitive daenerys claps back but then daenerys has to go north and then maybe you get a couple more episodes of daenerys going mad queen in episode eight well i think that and this ties into how i feel about daenerys's decision to uh destroy king's landing is that cersei should have had more up her sleeve she should have had plans she should she should have utilized the wildfire and things that we've seen her do in the past because she absolutely gets obliterated. You talk about a bad battle plan for against the Night King. What was her plan? Maybe I'll get a shot with the Scorpion? Yeah, she got really cocky. And I do love, I, it's another thing where I do love how dominant Drogon is. You have a dragon. It should be a mismatch. But this is the conclusion. And you have Cersei at her last stand where she's willing to sacrifice the people of King's Landing by using them as a shield. I don't know. Lure the Northmen in. Blow up some fucking buildings with wildfire. You know, try to, I guess, bait Daenerys into doing this don't just lose <laughs> and just i'll tell you what for the bells like i said before when you watch this episode and you ignore ignore everything that came before it i love cersei just having nothing up her sleeve for this episode i wish if you had done that before where it was like cersei keeps poking at daenerys she keeps tugging on superman's cape and then that's what also helps daenerys snap in that moment where it's like fuck her she surrendered no she doesn't go down like this she's gonna watch everything burn that's the thing you need in the back of your head to make that episode work. It's so many different characters that weren't properly developed that hurt Daenerys' decision to go mad because that's what the season hinges on. However, I think this is the most interesting jamie has been in a couple of seasons. I think Jamie has a, has a very solid arc. He comes, he faces his demons in, that, in episode two when they're holding that kind of kangaroo court. And to me, that's a great scene. People are very critical of Jamie in this season. And I am not. I think a lot of it comes from I from the ending. But how do you do it? You have to have them die together. And I think that's it also comes from Cersei being on the sidelines. That them dying under the weight of the Red Keep, under the weight of all this animosity she's built, that's poetic. But you don't feel it. It just feels like they got smashed by bricks. I, I, Brick I like, Lannister, the Valonqar. I do like it, but would I prefer Jamie doing the Valonqar, killing Cersei to kind of relive his his moment he had when he killed the mad king now he's killing the mad queen to save the greater good yes i would have fucking loved that but i think the thing with jamie's character arc and his change i think he's always been that person that he talks about he always has been hateful but we've got this different view on him and we can understand some of his motivations and his ideals and it's a beautiful transition into a protagonist something that they should have done with Daenerys and made it and kind of flipped it. I think if they spent as much time and effort and had the time to do that like they did with Jamie, it would have been just as great, but they didn't. People said that Jamie threw away everything, his whole arc. I mean, that's always who he's, what he was. He, that's fine to me. It's never been a, a problem with me for ruining Jamie's arc. To me, that's... Uh, I hate when fans get upset about something like that. He's not this pristine uh, lion that we perceived him to be. We got a different perspective on, but that was always the greatness of his character, the complexity and his motivations. And his he has those two sides that are always in conflict. So he can be the guy who loves Brienne and wants to be with her, but he's always going to be the guy at his core who has to go back to Cersei. And that's a character flaw. He's not a perfect character, and I think that's what makes him great. It's sad when he leaves Brienne. At the time, too, we thought... He was, like, uh, doing it because he had to go kill Cersei. That's right, something yeah. he had to do. No, it is. Looking back, it is very sad. You feel bad for Brienne. And that moment when she writes all his deeds in the book, it, it hits you. But I also wonder if Tyrion is going to be the true Valonqar in the books, where it is misleading, where, oh, Jamie's also technically, he's a younger brother because they're twins, but George is like, no, it's obviously going to be Tyrion because he's going to be so infused with rage to get back at Cersei. And I wonder if he does find her where the Red Keep is is crumbling and falling down and he manages to slit her throat and then Jamie comes in and finds Cersei's dead body and just decides he no longer wants to live. So you get two for one. You get the Valonqar killing Cersei and you get Jamie and Cersei dying together. They came into the world, they gotta go out in the same way. But I was even maybe thinking Jamie should die during the long night, but he has to go out with Cersei. So I'm more disappointed with Cersei than I am Jamie in this season. But I guess we'll go to the other siblings, Sansa and Arya. Sansa, Sophie Turner, best season. This is the best season for Sansa. She's on point with her political machinations and all the 
different schemes that she has. And I don't think Sophie Turner has ever been better as this character. No, yeah, she was very good. I think a lot of it got, I think, bogged down by, like how you said, the back and forth with her and Daenerys. But I do think looking back on it, that is a natural reaction to have. She's... Well, we were afraid that the distrust between them wasn't going to feel natural. And I think it does for the most part because she does have some concerns. It's You have to think ahead if they do win the Long Night, what is going to happen to the North after everything that the North has seen, after everything that she's seen. So... Well, it's kind of like as an audience, you're like, come on, we, we know what's coming. We know what's going to happen. There's no time to, I guess, have a back and forth because the real enemy is coming. But in the moment and their characters, everything they've been through both are strong women in power, uh, positions of power, it's natural to think, well, who's this person coming in? What does this mean for my position, the North as a whole, and everything I tried to help build? And one of the more controversial scenes was the scene between Sansa and the Hound, where she says that if she didn't go through everything she went to, she still would have been a little bird. And I don't think that was meant to justify the decisions the showrunners made. I think that was meant to show how just corrupting this world can be, and how messed up this world could be, where the Hound almost looks at her walking away, thinking... I could have prevented all of this. You know, I, I could have shown her an easier life. And obviously the hardships of being a Stark, we're always going, you're always going to have to meet them head on. But it could have been a bit lighter. And I think the Hound, he, he has a lot of regret for not convincing Sansa to go with him. But just to see her at her full power was, it was really great. I do love that she ended up being Queen of the North. That's always something that, whether I thought John or Daenerys would have taken a throne, that she would somehow end up in that position as ruling the North. And that's just a natural progression for her character. And she's more, she's like a more skilled Ned Stark because she does still hold on to that empathy for humanity, for her people. And she's very sympathetic, but she can be ruthless at times and she can play the game. We see that when Daenerys says Jon Snow betrayed me and she breaks down the order of the betrayal that she, the way Sansa was able to spread her secret through Tyrion. That's why Tyrion, when she says to him, I used to think you were the, the cleverest man in the world, Tyrion has lost his edge because he has become so solely focused on putting Daenerys on the throne. That's all he cares about. I think they did rip away some of his complexity. I guess he's grappling with his own demons. He talks about how he hasn't been with a woman in years. So he's really going through a personal rehab. But I don't know, you kind of want to see more of the edge to him. And Sansa's able to take advantage of him. But she does that throughout the season, where she's kind of a step ahead of all the other players. And I like to see that, because even though the development with Littlefinger could have been handled better, and with a bit more taste, actually, um, it makes sense that this this was always the ending for her character. To be a Littlefinger with, with a bigger heart. Yeah, kind of understanding that you need to be both Ned Stark and Littlefinger in this world. And I think Tyrion had a lot of that, too. Right, yeah, you need a little bit of both. As for her sister, Arya, you know, I, there were a lot of moments, a lot of action moments that I enjoyed with Arya. And Arya is another character where she had just become so hardened by the world that it was hard for her to kind of just enjoy social settings. She always struggled with that before, but she's always off to the side. She's shooting arrows. She's not very talkative anymore. So the reunion with her and John was good. It was good to see them together. And it's so cool to just see all these characters in one setting. One thing I'll say about the long night, but her sequence of tap dancing on all those whites and Davos is just watching her. To me, that that's awesome. There's a point where sh they really start to focus on her in the battle. Her stealth sequence, straight out of a video game, I thought that was great. More people wanted to see her using her faceless abilities. And that, to me, goes back to George R. R. Martin. Sorry, George, you do get a pass. Taking so long to write these books... You're telling D&D to be as clever as George R. R. Martin in six months as he is in ten years. Maybe there has, maybe in the books there is something to do with Arya's abilities, and Sansa and Jon convince her to assassinate somebody, and it's really clever, and it, it ties into the ultimate ending of Daenerys destroying the throne. I don't know, what are your thoughts? <laughs> I just said a lot, but what are your thoughts on Arya? She gets the big hero moment. She gets the shout-out by Drake at whatever award show he was at. Shout-out to Arya Stark for putting in that work last week. Hey. She gets the t-shirt. Hell of a t-shirt. Hell of a t-shirt. She's such a fan favorite, too, but... With the shortened season, like, we're gonna keep saying this a million times, but there really isn't much for her to do in terms of, I guess... And I think she's just boiled down to being a very good warrior. Do you like her in Gendry? Do you mind that? Don't hate it. Don't love it. There's a lot of things with this season. <laughs> it's fine, you know? But it's nice to have, like, those moments of where she's not a complete, just soulless killer. You know, she's still Arya, and she still has human emotion, but she also has the ability to 
rip your face off, wear it, and kill anybody she wants. It's way more realistic with her than Bran, because Bran just turns a switch. Bran turns a switch, and he's got no more human emotions. Arya, it's kind of been progressive. I think Arya is also somebody who was hurt by a previous season. She's hurt by season five, because everything with the Faceless Men, they just destroyed all the mystery with that secret organization, whatever the fuck they are, this uh, this cult of assassins. It's it's hard to watch her in season five and season six. But then she's awesome. It's the same thing with Sansa. It's eventually they were going to become awesome at a very specific thing. But the journeys there, even in previous seasons, aren't great. So Arya is, that's what she's meant to do, right? Like you said, in season eight, she's a warrior. So you bring Arya into the fight, you give her dragon stone, dragon glass spear thingy, and she's going to be formidable. But that's that's fine with me, I guess. You know, you can't hearken on the past of season five. I still do like her killing the Night King, but I think a lot surrounding that could have been a little better to kind of amplify that moment. And that's the thing, too, with the inclusion of the Night King in the show. It's who's going to kill the Night King. It has to be Jon because they had that look, or it has to be Bran because... It's the Green Seer versus the Three-Eyed Raven versus the Night King. So I think a lot of people were like, oh, is Arya Azor High now because she killed the Night King? No, because the show really doesn't have an Azor High. No, they don't have and a Valonqar. You can see it where you could... The way I see it is it's Jon and Daenerys because they brought their forces together and led the charge against the Night King to bring the dawn. So they did it in that way. It's not who killed the Night King. It's why everyone was there to stand up against the Night King. And it's a great way to end the battle in one punch. It's a great way to get rid of all the whites in one sweep. It's killing 100,000 birds with one stone by creating the Night King and saying that he brought them all back to life. You wonder in the books it's going to be battle after battle after battle months of them trying to get rid of his forces not the night king or just the white walkers in general i don't know maybe it is Arya just has that moment i don't even know if Arya is going to be there for the fight in the books to tell you the truth and we don't know what's going to happen in essos we don't know if this same event is happening in essos because the books are a bit different but i wish the season was better because that hero moment would be celebrated more <laughs> it was i remember when i said it i said the subversion was the same level as the red wedding and I guess it is still now, but... Well, in the moment, I mean, a lot of the episodes... I was shocked in the moment. Yeah. I was stunned. Because we didn't think that this guy was... That was, I guess, maybe your idea, right? Yeah, that was your theory, that maybe the Night King will be killed in one episode. And well, then it happened. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the thing, too. Maybe we should have seen this coming with the shortened season, where how are they going to be able to... <laughs> the whole marketing of, we're only showing the first three episodes. That should have been an indication that this would only last... For three episodes. Well, the whole thing, too, was um, leading up to it with D&D. It's kind of like, well, you know, the show might have taken a little bit of a dip after the books, but that's that's only natural, right? Because you had masterpieces at your disposal, and when you're not, you're, when you run out of the source material, it's hard to kind of put things together and follow up on things that were set up that you don't necessarily have. And it's, you know, it's, you can forgive them for maybe a, a little dip in quality, but when they're at their best, man, are they at their best? And then season eight's coming. Well, they had the ending from George. They've had years to kind of play out in their minds and they know what they're going to do. So maybe that's all they need is six episodes. That's the story they have to tell. And looking back on it, well, eh. Well, I still we still get comments from the from this day. Our video top ten best and worst changes. When I said that D and D aren't going to mess up the big fight in the final season because how can't they? Because everything's just been set up for them on a silver platter. Right, and when that showdown happens, the Song of Ice and Fire, Dragons vs. Walkers, it's going to be that much better because we've been patient and we've waited. They're going to deliver because how can't they? <laughs> I get, I get called out for that comment every single day. But yeah, with Arya, she was cool. I mean, Maisie Williams, I've said that she was the best child actor, and she's really grown into a fantastic actress throughout the run of this show. Isaac Hempstead Wright as Bran. What did you think about Bran in this season? Obviously, the point of contention with Bran is King Bran. King Bran's got the best story, does he? Aaron Rodgers doesn't think so. He come down to the end, and Tyrion says the person with the best story is Bran. But as much as I like the first half of the finale... I dislike the second half of the finale. Right. It's just so off. It feels... It's an epilogue. It's not... Na it's so weird to me. It doesn't feel like the show I've been watching. When they go out and see all... I'm like, who are the half of these people? <laughs> They're all the characters you've had Robin, throughout the year. Robin, It's Mir. just... It's, uh, I don't know. But there are a couple things I think that no matter what, no matter how developed they were, if season seven and eight were ten episodes that people still wouldn't like, I think Daenerys is one. Even if there was proper development, I think there's a large portion of the fan base that maybe would still be upset and felt betrayed by that moment. Oh yeah, and that would have been awesome. 
Those debates would have been great. Well, it's, it's I, if we were coming off of a critically because the critics would have loved it. The critics wouldn't have cared as much as the hardcore fans. It's yeah. the same thing with Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker's on a distant planet. Uh, who gives a fuck? The movie was good. The fans would have been so divided on Daenerys, if even if it was well done. Well, I think and I that said awesome. going into this season, what I would hate the most is to have like a a reaction like the Last Jedi, where it's just so divisive, where you have half the people who love it and think it's a masterpiece, half the people who hate it and think it's a piece of garbage. Oh, I wish we had that. I, I'm killing for that. Yeah, that would have been so <laughs> that, much better. That would have been fun to have a debate, I guess. And, and it would have been our Last Jedi. We could have been the defenders. You yeah, know? but I think, I think that we would have liked it. it's kind of where where it is now. It's, you know, most people hate it, and the people who are like me, who are probably the highest on it, still are like, it's not, it's still the worst season, you know? So... <laughs> But yes, Daenerys going Mad Queen and Bran being king. Those are the two things you think people would have... No matter what happened, no matter how much development. Because Bran, as we see him now, is not the Bran that I love or that I loved in the books. He's a totally different character. And if you knew Bran was going to be king, why? Why would you take him out for an entire season? <laughs> yeah, I know. They had to have known since the very beginning, since when he told them the ending. Yes. So you, you skip him out of the season and he comes back. He's still Bran. Like, for, yeah, season six, he's, he's still, still kind Bran, of Bran. And I think he's still a good character because <sighs> one through four, I love Bran, especially in the earlier seasons. I love season six Bran too. When the door not, is my favorite episode of that season. When the Three-Eyed Raven dies and he kind of ingests all this information and becomes Dr. Manhattan, like, it's not cool, it's not intriguing, it's just kind of, who is this character? He's Why a plot do, device. I don't really, you kill, like, Bran's dead. The old Bran is dead. And I guess that's kind of the point of being Three-Eyed Raven, but... Give yeah, but if the three eyed raven Give was actually more. Dr. Manhattan, if Bran was Professor Xing during the Long Night, or if he was going back in time to find some a very important piece of information. But I also hate the theories now. Bran can see into the future, so he just planned this all out because he's evil and wants to be king. Bran can see very brief flashes of the future. I mean, he probably saw himself with the crown and thought, oh shit, I'm going to become king. Um, that's why people always take that line. Why do you think I came all this way? Why do you think I came all this way? No, Bran is not some evil sorcerer who willed this into existence. I, I don't think that's it. Bad attempt at a joke. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. And the Knights of the Round Table, them crowning a king, it's terrible. Edmir Tully speaking up, I guess it's kind of funny. <laughs> Sansa should have been better in this scene. Yeah, I wish she should have. Uh, John should have been there. John, if you're not going to make him king, at least tease it. At least give him the first right of refusal. It's, oh, here's the Targaryen, the one who can unite the North and the South, Targaryen and Stark, it's destiny. And then he says no. Maybe that works even better for people because he was given the opportunity. It's like Daenerys touching the throne but not sitting on it. To a lot of people, that was satisfying. But at least, they even mention him. They're like, wasn't Jon supposed to be here? And Grey Worm's like, we decide. <laughs> well, it's like... I was watching. Why, why isn't he there? And why couldn't have Bran made the decision in front of everyone to send Jon north of the Wall and then gave him a little wink? Like, oh, Grey Worm, we're, we'll send him to the Night's Watch. That's such a great... He bopped Grey Worm. He's sending him to his paradise. <laughs> that The happiest Jon Snow was in this season, or for a very long time, was when he and Daenerys went riding those dragons and said, well, let's stay here for a thousand years. That was the happiest he's been. And then he gets sent there at the end, and he's got that little smile on his face, the last scene of, last scene of the show. It's brilliant. Why isn't he there? Well, it's like... He's Jon Snow! I remember I was, I was watching, re-watching the finale, and Daenerys says, we can't hide behind small mer mercies. And I'm thinking about... We can't hide behind small mercies. The world we need won't be built by men loyal to the world we have. The world we need is a world of mercy. It has to be. All the things that she's done to liberate others, and she's given mercy before, and kind of how that never worked out, and when she says no one in Westeros will ever love me, the people that she liberated and some of the cities that in Marine and all these other places, they didn't necessarily love her either. And even all the effort she put into building better worlds, it was never enough to sustain it. And kind of in that moment where I kind of, her saying that and thinking back on the bells and kind of she needs to burn down the old world to build a new world. I loved all that. Going back to the vision of the undying when, oh, it's not snow, it's ash. And it's kind of the same thing. And before she can sit on the throne, she is called to be on the wall where it's kind of like the afterlife. You know, it made me think of all that. I'm like, oh, why did I hate this episode again? And then this all started with <laughs> the... And even John kind of fulfilling the Azor High prophecy by killing Daenerys in a way and bringing in a time of peace. I, I don't hate that at all, too. And then the whole dynamic of the lords of Westeros and the Unsullied uh, occupying King's Landing, it's just so off. The debate between John and Daenerys about 
what's good is so poorly written. How'd you know? How'd you know it'll be good? Because I know what is good. And so do you. I know. You do. The only line I like that is when it's been our destiny since you had the the name of a bastard boy. And then she goes, and I was a little girl who couldn't count to 20. <laughs> it is though nice if you look at it as the scene of the House of the Undying is what happens after Daenerys dies. She is with Rhaegal and Drogo, and that's kind of what she always wanted. Just before she had aspirations of being a, a liberator and queen, you know, she just wanted to be happy. The Red Door from the books. She just wants to have a family, so... Well, Drogo, Drogon took her to be resurrected in Essos, right, by a red priest? <laughs> no, he probably just took her to bury her. No, it is a sad ending for Daenerys, but to just go back to King Bran. I mean, I like that. I, I like what he's going for there, that kind of the benevolent dictator, more of a monarch, not a constitutional monarchy, more so than just the traditional feudalistic monarchy of having a son, fathering children, passing on the dynasty. But the whole thing where it's like, oh, why don't we just have our horses have a say? Like... I don't know. It just takes me out of it every time. No, it's not well written. And the, even the whole scene is terribly written. Even I like the idea that Tyrion's talking about stories uniting people because that's what the title of the whole series is. It's a song of ice and fire, stories and songs. It's the one thing that you can't kill. But the way that he announces this to the lords and ladies of Westeros and to the audience, it's so anticlimactic. It's just I don't know. It just comes. It should have been more epic. This scene of of moving they, past, destroying the old world and trying to usher in a new world. I love that final scene of all of them having the small council meeting. Yeah. I think that's a great ending for them. I think it's funny because the back and forth with them debating what's more important, ships or brothel, it's it's lighthearted. Well, all that stuff and Tyrion's about, final line to me is perfect. Yeah. About bringing a... That's, that's a callback that I enjoy. I once brought a jackass and a honeycomb into a brothel. But like the whole thing, I think, they thought they nailed it with, you know, what's better than a great story? Like the story we just told that everyone's going to love and we go down in history very, as the it's greatest. S- super meta. Um, but like it's also you have John and Tyrion who betrayed your queen that you swore to protect. Let's choose a king to decide what happens with these prisoners that you said can't go free. Well, you know, we'll, we'll give Tyrion the second highest position in all the kingdom. We'll let John basically go to paradise. And so, all right, you guys, and we'll go to North. North, I think it is. I think, I think, like, the whole idea of not wanting to fight again, and they've been through so much and everything, okay, but just the way it all played out in that scene is just, just bad. Uh, that's, that's the one thing I... And I guess you kind of want to avoid some of the melodrama, because Game of Thrones can be very soap operatic at times. So they're kind of just, I guess, bypassing the moment of Grey Worm finding John in the throne room. Daenerys is gone. He admits to killing her. I guess you don't really need to show that, but maybe if they could have found a way to kind of present that in a more tense and thrilling way rather than John's just in a cell somewhere and Tyrion's been in a cell for months and we're all outside in the dragon pit that looks like shit. I don't know. It's there. There are so many. That's the thing. I, I almost wanted to go like how season eight should have been. I almost wanted to, to do that video, but then it becomes fan fiction, and we're not writers. That's the th- we, we know that there's something off, but this story is so goddamn complex, and George R. R. Martin always talks about the butterfly effect. If you change one thing, you have to change everything else. So I'm like, oh, Brienne should have died in The Long Night. But then who writes in Jamie's deeds in the books? I love that scene. Oh, that's it's like, that but Jamie should have died. always gets me. But then Cersei just dies by herself. She's supposed to go out with Jamie. You know, it, there's, it's so hard to write it. That's why I don't envy the people that were behind it. But uh. it's yeah, like everything I could, I say about like maybe they should have done this, maybe they should have done that. Yeah, it's good in theory, but trying to connect it is a whole nother story. So I try not to rewrite something or kind of say they should have done this. Because I really don't know how I would connect that. Well, like it's good in my head, but at some when you get down to it, it's it's hard to do. Going back to Tyrion, I loved when he reads the histories, the Song of Ice and Fire, the histories of Robert's War and the aftermath. I mean, the the histories of the five, the War of the Five Kings and the aftermath, and he's not mentioned at all. So, which is a one, terrible job by that fucking guy. Because yeah, how do you how do you not? He's the hand of the king, for God's sakes. You don't put that in your history, in the second highest powerful position in the Westeros. Well, his reputation. I guess doesn't really people don't know people truly don't know about because he came into power before that he was a plumber basically (laughs) so damn good one 
I like the idea of them doubling down on him making up for his mistakes. It's even the good deeds that you performed in this history in these last couple of years are completely forgotten. You have a fresh slate. The good and the bad is completely wiped out, and you have to kind of atone for what you've done. And they kind of leave it open-ended for 30 years. Kit Harrington is coming back for the HBO Game of Thrones virtual reality movie where, you know, when we have Neuralink in our brains. Because he says, did I do the right thing? He goes, ask me again in 10 years. So I like to imagine that there is a potential for a comeback decades down the road. But for Tyrion's ending, we we said it at the time, Peter Dinklage was was great with this character, and it's the most he has to do in a couple of seasons. So I enjoyed his arc, except for the first two episodes. And I, I like the converse, conversation he had with Varys. I love all that, and I do. Oh yeah, well the that's why the bells and the politicking in the last of the Starks is actually pretty intriguing as well. But a lot of yeah, his scenes with Varys, man, that final scene that they have in the throne room at Dragonstone, it's it's heartbreaking because it, it's them trying to find common ground, but you know they never are, and it ends up and it ends up being a goodbye between friends at a certain point you choose a person you believe in and you fight for that person even if you know it's a mistake but the one thing too about the Varys and Tyrion I guess motivations and such even before Rhaegal goes down and Missande that they're having these conversations they're entertaining the idea of Jon instead of Daenerys which I feel like is unfounded you know, they're, like I said she hasn't been yeah for Varys it's so goddamn unfounded yeah. Even before, like you said, it's before Rhaegal and Masande had died. It's because they're only saying it because they know it's eventually going to be true. Yeah. It's not them saying it in the moment. It's not Var- Varys believing it. It's the foreshadowing that people claim is there throughout the season. Maybe it's in other seasons. It's just not enough in this season. And well, it's always I have to mention the Iron Fleet hiding behind those rocks. So dumb. Such a terrible way to take out Rhaegal. I do think... It's dumb. I do Don't think, defend it. I'm not defending <laughs> I do think when people say, like, when they make fun of D&D... Well, they kind of forgot. Well, Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. I get what he was... Like, in that moment, she's home and she's free and everything. No. I get what they were they trying don't to get say. A All right. <laughs> for Rhaegal, for a dragon dude, they don't he have could, scouts? I know, I know, I know. I'm Obviously, just saying, they send scouts I'm just to saying I get what they were going for, but I agree with you and that sense and what Tyrion talks to John about when how everything she's done in her past she's been told that she's been cheered for it. she's been cheered yeah right? everywhere she goes evil men die and we cheer her for it and she grows more powerful and more sure that she is good and right and that kind of got to her head and thing. I think he's, a, I think he's, it's easy to say that after seeing what she did, but that assessment of her, I don't think is something that, because everything Daenerys has done in the past has been done to protect people like the people of King's Landing. And I get the stressors of having one of your children die, your Masande die, feeling alone and everything that you've worked for slipping away because of the threat that maybe John might take the throne or, I don't know, that feeling of loneliness and betrayal and that getting to her. He has the better claim to the throne. Every time a Targaryen is born, the gods flip a coin. The Mad King gave his enemies the justice he thought they deserved. Children are not their fathers. Be a dragon. You have a gentle heart. A Targaryen alone in the world. It's a terrible thing. You don't want to wake the dragon, do you? I do understand that, but from point A to point B, ah, you got to convince me. You got to do more. And to... you can, like I, I keep saying, there's a way that you can do the shortened season. You can do, if there's enough there where somebody just snaps. And like Tyrion says to John, you've been on the back of a dragon. You've had that power. Would you have done it? That's a good question. You don't know what you do. And John says, you, it's, it's easy to make a decision staring at the but battlefield. Make for... it more justifiable with still having doubt. Right. Make yeah. It, yeah. Make, yeah. No. Of make course. them have like make it a do or die decision. And but there is moments when people just do snap, and this person just happened to be on the back of a dragon. And it's also more of what I wanted to feel for Daenerys is okay. They're never going to love me. She says that. Let it be fear. They're never going to love me, so even though I won here, it's just going to be years and years of pushback, and they're never going to understand that I am their rightful ruler. This is a good way to get the message across, by burning down their fucking city, by killing hundreds of thousands. Burn down the Red Keep. Right, yeah. No, but her just burning down the whole city, it's it's more of like, fuck them, you know? It's not about building a better world, and she keeps justifying it in her Thanos-like speeches, but you just don't pick that up from it, you know? It, it more feels like she just got pissed off because Masande died. That's just, I mean, I like Masande. When I keep thinking back on it, I think do think there's enough there with 
made the decisions she's made in the past and having these events happen but i just need a little more to it's like we talked about jamie it didn't happen overnight with jamie it took a little bit for our perspective to change and be like well he pushed bran out the window but he's still the guy who saved all those people in king's landing and yes he's killed his cousin but he saved brianne so we can kind of justify and when our perspective changes, we can view them in uh, a light that we view some of the other protagonists we like in this show. It's not it's not that with Daenerys. No. Um, just going back to Bran as, as king and what that kind of means, what's the message that George is trying to convey with that? It's interesting because you kind of have um, Skynet. Bran can see everything that's happening. So if you bring somebody, if you accuse somebody of, of a crime and Bran is the judge, you are, go- you are going to be served justice. I always talk about that, you know, the the dilemma of freedom and security. If you have nothing to hide, then you should be okay. But I, I guess it's a step in the right direction for the society. I guess that's the message here, that having leaders who, who know justice, who have a moral compass. I guess with Bran, he still has a sense of morality. He just personally doesn't feel these things. But he knows what's right and wrong. Which, it's interesting. It goes back to the conversation between John and Daenerys, you know. What about all the other people that think they know what's good? They don't get to choose. I guess with Bran, it's it's a best of both worlds situation. And like I said, the, the people that he has surrounding him, the advisors, they're all pretty decent. Why is Bran there? I liked it. No, I the think. scene with Braun threatening Jamie and Tyrion is is terrible because the guy randomly comes in. How did he get past security? He's there. He threatens them. He's like, I, I'll kill you if you don't give me Highgarden. Okay, I'll give you Highgarden. And then it's like, oh, that guy that threatened me, arrest him. Kill him. <laughs> does Tyrion like Braun that much? I guess he does. That's not a responsible person to be putting in as the head of Highgarden. It's not. Or the master of coin. Or the master. Right. That's it, it seems like because Braun is a cutthroat. Braun is very much like, yeah, I like you, Tyrion. I have fun with you, but I'll kill you if somebody. Well, yeah, tells I, I didn't me. hate that because that's kind of how it was, and that's kind of Braun always been. I, I, I still think they can be friends, but. But then he became chummy, chummy, um, retired now. I guess I'm funny. I don't know. Chummy, chummy, I'm retired now. I guess I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> that's him at the table. It's serious business, but he's joking about brothels. I, I don't know if you could trust Braun <laughs> as master of coin. The butterfly effect of who is going to be where at the end of the books is so fascinating to me. It's who's go. What? How does that scene look uh, for Bran's final chapter, Bran's final PO, POV? Who is he sitting with uh, on his council? If he's I like, think, he I is think in Tyrion sh- ends in that spot. Yes. Yeah. That's the thing. I think a lot of these moments that I think a lot of the the things that happen in the final season are obviously going to be in the books. They're, too big to not to. Daenerys is going Mad Queen. Bran is going to be king. But the road there is going to be different. And with POVs and getting the insight into what they're thinking and how their mind is working, I think it's so much easier to convey thoughts of loneliness and madness and kind of that shift when you actually can have it right on paper for you to read. And uh, the old adage with filmmaking is show, don't tell. And you, you said it, that conversation between Tyrion and Varys before Rhaegal is shot. They're telling us that Varys has misgivings about Daenerys. And they've told us that in the past, but we haven't seen anything to kind of agree with Varys. We haven't been shown why Daenerys could fall into this madness. And there, there are so many different problems. There are a lot of great things about this season as well. Obviously, the production, the production design, the acting, the special effects. I don't, I don't think TV has ever looked better, well, that's why depending I, on what type of TV you have. So there, there are so many good things. There are so many moments of true Game of Thrones brilliance throughout this season. I wonder if in 20 years, maybe we lighten up because the what came before it was so great. And at the end of the day, season eight is epic cinema. At yeah. the very least, it's epic cinema. That's why I defend it because there are so many problems but there are still so much i like and i have a hard time dismissing it as a total piece of trash or garbage or zero out of ten because there is a lot of good i still love the characters i love um i think a lot of the episodes are good but not properly developed but i don't think that makes it complete garbage even if i don't think daenerys's descent into madness was properly developed that last 20 minutes of the bells is fucking haunting (laughs) and it's put me on the edge of the seat while I was watching it now and when I watched it the first time. So even the long night, I still had a great time watching that battle. Things could have been adjusted to make it better and there are things that don't make sense and and things I necessarily don't like all that much, but I still overall, I think it's good. Like I said before, that's hard. Just good isn't good enough though when you have the standard of excellence that was Game of Thrones and I don't blame people when they talk about it negatively. It's hard to say that I'm 100% right in my assessment because nobody is. Just because I can look by some other things, I understand why people can't. Yeah, and I wonder how long we are going to be debating and discussing 
the finale of Game of Thrones. Like we opened up with the video, it's unfortunate to see it kind of, the excitement and the love for this series kind of dissipate over the past year. That's the worst part for me, knowing no matter how much time passes or the more we reflect on it, season eight will never be well received. And that hurts. Hey, it may be. It may be. (sighs) And a couple of, like I said, man, sometimes over time, people may look back and say, hey, it's not the best ending. That's the thing. I don't think it's such a... I don't think it's as bad as people have made it out to be. I think because the story is so complex. I was surprised that more casual fans were more didn't, didn't receive this finale more warmly. A lot of casual fans I know hated it, too. <laughs> so that's the thing. Where the, where the problems were seeping through, where people who weren't even that steeped into the lore could see the problems that's that's when you get to an iffy iffy place but uh, it's gonna be fun to see how it unfolds it's like the, the lord of the rings trilogy where fellowship and two towers are both 10 out of 10s and everyone loves them and the third one comes out and it's a six it's right. just like a your average high fantasy battle whatever action movie we always say that the and scales just, change yeah and it's like all right well it still might be good but compared to the first two what what is this and that's kind of what it feels like with Game of Thrones, obviously Lord of the Rings, all of them are tens, but yeah, I guess to hammer home on David Benioff and DB Wise, <laughs> I mean they've taken so much flack over this last year and over the last couple of years because they always had people that didn't necessarily love their adaptation. But it's such a weird case in Hollywood. You always hear about scripts. 90% of scripts that are written never get made. You always hear about directors having passion projects that it takes them years to get made or they never do get made. HBO was throwing, willing to throw money at them for three more years. And they said no. Creatives in Hollywood said, no, I don't want to continue this story. And I can understand, hey, it took them two years to do season eight. It was probably exhausting. It got exhausting talking about it. I'll tell you that much. I can't imagine writing it. And the amount of pressure, and like we said, the books are very complex. He hasn't released a book in almost 10 years. How do you bring that home in six months? How do you do that? But (laughs) extend it. Stick around. Because instead of becoming the scorn of nerd fandom, you could have been gods. You could have been gods of the nerd world if you brought this home. If you brought this home with a satisfying 8, 9 out of 10 type finale. You just gotta finish it. And I know it's hard, and I, I feel bad for them. I do, because it comes with the territory. When it's great, you get the praise, and when it's not, people are gonna dump on you. And I'm, <laughs> I just wish they would have stayed or handed the reins to somebody else. Acknowledge that you're burnt out from this and let somebody bring it. But you can't do that either, right? Uh, I don't know. It's so tough. In reality, if we... It would have taken like two more years probably to get another season. We would have been like upset. But and especially with what's going it, on now, who knows? Yeah, it's, it would have been worth it though. I think if they looked back the way, if, if they kind of knew how they were going to be received after this, I think they might have taken a step back and it's like, all right, we really need to nail it. But, you know, part of me thinks that they thought they did. And I think the, the worst thing about season eight as a whole, uh, I don't really reflect on, you know, certain decisions or character moments or scenes it's just i think the worst part for me is just how it is perceived because when you invested so much time and you're such a huge part of your life and just seeing how the season turned out and just the overall community consensus on the season is so disappointing it's just it's depressing it sucks but what are you gonna do well what you can do is check out our anime series that we are actually going to write and produce a song of ice and fire we're going to do 30 seasons we're going to adapt the books verbatim so make sure that we hit on all those notes for you book lovers you're actually playing cersei right aaron we're doing what yeah i signed a deal with um netflix it sounds awful yeah no it doesn't sound great well, i get to play cersei though yeah you get to play cersei all right i'm in Oh, guess the video's over. Ended pretty abruptly. Hey guys, Bo Oliver here for one final send-off. And before we go, we would like to thank our very special Patreon members, pledgers, whatever you guys want to call yourselves. You keep the lights on here at the studio. So it's really our pleasure to review all these movies, TV shows, video games that we all know and love. And we actually have a couple of shows that have been suggested by Patreon members that we will be reviewing in the next couple of weeks. And if you're a fan of anime, get excited because we have Neon Genesis, My Hero Academia, Full Metal Alchemist Brotherhood, not technically an anime, but also Castlevania. And of course, if you want to visit our Patreon page and pledge, see the different rewards that we have. Maybe you can suggest a show, a movie, a video game. Or maybe you don't want to do any of that. Honestly, watching up until this point of the video is good enough for me. So, thank you out there, and stay safe.